everybody, welcome back to our study in the book of Revelation, and we're uh, examining verse by verse and uh, applying this to our practical lives. And we're in Revelation chapter 4, and now we're looking at uh, the throne room of God. We've talked about it before, and now we're going to focus in on the rainbow around the throne of God and the significance of that. In verse 3 of chapter 4, it says, And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And, and so when we see this scene, it's a beautiful scene, obviously, and uh, John is seeing that around the throne is this rainbow of emerald green. Um, and when you look at green, uh, it's always a symbol of eternal life. Right, and, and so that's what the greenish color, the emerald color represents. But um, let's focus in on the rainbow itself. The rainbow obviously contains all the colors of the spectrum. There are, there are colors that we, we still can't see with the naked eye, but exist. And uh, the rainbow then carries all those colors. So when we're in heaven, we'll be able to see all of those colors that we can't see today. But when you look at the multiplicity of colors and that the rainbow uh, contains all the colors of the spectrum, it's a reference to all the blessings that God has, uh, that the rainbow contains all the blessings. And that's why it's, it's cer encircling around the throne is this is the center of all the blessings. The rainbow contains all the blessings of God. And if you look at the law of first mention, when the rainbow shows up, it, it showed up after Noah's flood, remember that? And God threw a rainbow into the sky as a token of the covenant. Um, but it, uh, it represents blessing, okay? It represents promise, and it represents covenant. That's what the, the rainbow represents. It, it obviously refers to the Noahic covenant, and I'll, I'll talk about that, but it includes a lot more. So this rainbow encircles the throne. Um, and again, uh, it's, it, it, it's trying to focus our attention on all of the blessings and promises of God uh, that God has made to mankind, okay? Um, not just for the flood or after the flood, but all of them he has made to them. So the, the rainbow then becomes symbolic it's a real rainbow around the throne, but it's symbolic of God's faithfulness to his word and to his covenants that he has made. It's, it's a sign of his, and in those covenants and his word is a sign of his grace, his mercy, his long suffering, and his promise to bring justice. That's all included in all of this. That's why that rainbow is there. And the rainbow is not a half a rainbow. A rainbow is, it completely encircles the throne. And um, again, um, the fact that it circles the throne, because a real rainbow, when you see it, I know we, all, we always see just half of a rainbow, but when you see a real rainbow from the sky, it's a circle. Um, and so a real rainbow, um, when you see all of its aspects, is a circle. So the concept of a circle is the promise of eternal life through the sun, obviously. And, um, and he's stating this right before the discussion of judgment in the rest of the book of Revelation. Um, uh, you know, the judgment's gonna come in the tribulation and then obviously hail. Uh, and so it's saying, look, I, I will give you eternal life. I, I, I will give you blessing and eternal life and you can escape all of this judgment. You can escape hell if you would just accept me by faith. I would give you everything contained in the rainbow, the promises, the blessings, the covenants, all of that. Um, it's so um, obviously not everyone takes God up on that offer. Uh, Jesus said, you know, broad is the road of destruction and many who find it and narrow is the path and few who find it. And so, so God is trying to tell people, look, I will bring justice to the situation uh, because I am holy and righteous, but you can avoid this, and my son will be the one who uh, takes your wrath, uh, and, and um, you can be forgiven, and the wrath will not come upon you. That's what this rainbow is symbolizing on the throne, or around the throne, I should say, okay? 
And so uh, those who um, come into this covenant with God through the new covenant, through the Messiah, are, will be protected, just like Noah was protected from the flood. Um, and if you accept Christ's sacrifice and his offering and who he is, he's the God-man, um, then you come inside the ark. You come into the safety, right? And remember, there was only one door for the ark and symbolizing the one way through Christ. And then when you're in the ark, God shut the door and you were kept safe and secure in that ark. And that's the way it is with coming into Christ. You come to him and you go through that one path through Jesus Christ and then God shuts the door, which means you have eternal security. You're, you're forever saved. You, cannot, you can't lose your salvation. So that's what his promises are, are saying. This is what the rainbow is reflecting, okay? So this is a throne, um, no doubt, that's about to execute judgment, but it's a throne of, of promise, a throne of grace, a throne of, of righteousness, a throne of blessing as well, okay? And unfortunately, in our day, the LGBT agenda has stolen the rainbow. It's interesting that the rainbow has really seven visible colors, um, but the LGBT flag has six, so six always is fall short. And so they use six uh, colors, and because they do fall short, everyone falls short. Um, but they've tried to hijack God's symbol, but they can't. Um, we know what the symbol means. Um, the rainbow actually is a symbol for the Messiah. That's really what it represents. Just like the tree of life in the garden, that is a representation of Christ and so is the rainbow. The rainbow uh, is interesting because uh, Christ, as you know, is the mediator between man and God, right? And, and you know that. The rainbow actually serves as a bridge between heaven and earth, okay? It's kind of like Jacob's ladder, and we know Jacob's ladder is Christ, and, and so the rainbow, and when you see it, connects heaven and earth. And so that's why it's a symbol of Christ as a mediator. <clears throat> and so, you know, it's funny, when the secular world hears about Noah's flood, um, they, they want to accuse God of being a monster for bringing such a terrible, you know, judgment on people. Why would God destroy his creation? But they, they don't understand that for 120 years, God had been preaching through Noah to be saved, to get on the ark. Um, the genetic coding had been messed up and then fouled up. You had fallen angels and demons and, and all kinds of things creating havoc before the flood. And so God had to destroy it all. Um, and, but he would preserve you. If you would come on that, that, that ark, he would preserve you. So he made a way of escape. So God's not a monster. He needed to execute judgment. And just like now, today, uh, you know, he promised not to flood the world, but the next judgment will be the tribulation. And that's called, uh, metaphorically, the judgment of fire. Um, and that's where he brings the, you know, the 28 um, judgments to this world um, to, to bring justice to it and to rid the world of sin, to rid the world of the Antichrist, rid the world of Satan. Um, and that's what the tribulation is about. I mean, it has a lot of other aspects to it about Israel and about the tribulation saints and, and the judgment of the nations, but the primary goal is to rid the earth of sin and evil and Satan and fallen angels and demons and then usher in the kingdom. That's the whole purpose of it. So it's not that God's a monster, it's God's holy, God is righteous. And eventually, he has to bring justice to the situation. It would be like, um, you know, someone took your son and daughter and killed them, raped them, and, and did whatever they wanted to. You would go in front of the judge and say, I want justice, right? I want justice for my loved one that was killed and raped and murdered. And just, you know, like, like if one of your kids were killed at the October 7th attack by Hamas, right? You would want justice for that. That's what God's doing in judgment. Um, he's given people the time to repent. He says that in 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, but eventually, time is up. 
and you've got to make a decision. And so that's what God is trying to say through the rainbow is I will give you a time to repent and you can have all these promises, you can have all these blessings and you can live with me forever. But if you don't, then I will exercise judgment on you because I have to. You, you are a sinner. You have broken my laws and you have sinned against an eternal being. And when you sin against an eternal being, it requires an eternal debt. And that's why Christ plays such a pivotal role in all of this for salvation is because he can pay your debt eternally because he's an eternal being. And when he died on a cross, which only a man can do, but, his, but him being God, uh, his death, his physical death as a man has eternal value because he's God. He's the God-man. And that's how the two natures work in creating the perfect sacrifice that can pay back God eternally for eternal crimes that we have committed against God. Right? That's, that's the idea. That's the theological teaching to understand. So God is not a monster. He's making a way of escape, right, through his son. As you see a rainbow, like I talked about, it's a, it's a complete circle from above, right? And, and that's, it's not half like what we see. It's a complete circle. The interesting thing, the circle dynamic of a token continues to be seen through Scripture. Circumcision is creating a circle. Uh, when you circumcise a male, uh, it creates a circle. It's a, it's a, so that's a, another uh, sign that God used. And so the circle, uh, it, it represents eternity, but it also represents completeness. Uh, it encompasses all within a particular s scope of being, of reality, right? Um, and basically then when you're, when you're looking at the rainbow as being a sign of promise and a sign of blessing, well, the, the circle of the rainbow encompasses all the details of those promises and blessings. That's, that's what it's trying to communicate. I know this is highly symbolic, but that's, this is to understand the Bible from a Hebraic standpoint. You've got to understand the symbolic nature of things. You've got to understand what a circle means. You've got to understand what a rainbow means, right? Otherwise, you'll miss this. And you'll think, okay, there's a rainbow around the throne, and you just continue to read on, not understanding the significance of what this represents. Obviously, God is the eternal one, right? And, and um, the rainbow is a reference to him. It's a reference to Christ and, the, and being the eternal one. Um, but as you know, a circle is never ending. It's unending. It's, um, it's unknowable. It's unmeasurable because it just keeps going in a circle, right? It's ungraspable. It's a way of understanding with our rational minds the nature of God. It's not a perfect, but it, 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 it gives us a good grasp. Well, what do you mean? Well, God is unending because he's eternal, God is unknowable in the sense that we know what we know because of revelation, but there's a lot of things we don't know of God. And we're gonna be revealed more when we're in heaven. And basically, because he's eternal, there we will continue to understand God um, better as we're in heaven. So. In 10,000 years in heaven, you'll know more about God than in another 10,000 more years, you'll know more about God and he just will keep revealing himself to us because he's eternal. And I know that's hard to grasp, but that's what the circle is trying to say, that because he's the eternal one, you can't fully understand him completely. We, we understand the 66 books in which he gave us, but we're gonna understand more but you never can exhaust it. So in that sense, eternality is unknowable completely because we'll, we will forever be learning about him, if that makes sense. Um, God is unmeasurable, right, because he's spirit, uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, all these, these aspects you see in a circle um, depicts uh, kind of in a, in a way that we can understand the eternal nature of God. Right? So it's a symbol of divinity, no doubt about that, okay? Um, and perfection. Um, we know that God's perfect, right? And the circle, uh, rainbow, 
represents perfection. So think about this uh, in math as an example. Um, when you measure the circumference of a circle by pi, right, 3.14, uh, it's an irrational number. The true value of pi actually is an unending decimal number. You remember that in math? So, so using the circle, the point is regardless of how many decimal places you carry pi out to, you can never resolve or finalize its final decimal place. It never ends. That's the whole point of pi. And, and, and although you can come closer and closer in our rational minds, you never can fully resolve pi um, or even understand one of them. So that's the idea of the circle and pointing to God's divinity. Um, you never can resolve pi. And, and, and so we're going to continue to grow in our understanding and we never uh, can exhaust knowing God. That's an amazing f aspect, right? So like I said, the rainbow um, contains all the promises. Just like it contains all the colors, it contains all the promises of God at the throne, right? That's what it represents. And the promises, many of the promises that God has made are unending. They are everlasting covenants, right? And we know this in Scripture that um, one of the covenants is the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what the rainbow encompasses because it's unending. Um, it promises a people. It promises, um, you know, a blessing uh, through God's people. It promises uh, a land uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his descendants. And that is an unending covenant. Um, just like today when we talk about... Um, the Jewish right to the land, the Jews' right for self-determination, the Jewish right to exist as a people group in their land, that's all going back to the Abrahamic covenant. And then we have the Davidic covenant that comes out of the Abrahamic covenant, and that Davidic is a covenant promises an eternal ruler from David's line. We know that to be the Messiah, and he will start that rule in the kingdom. And then that will be the first phase of it. Then the second phase of the kingdom will be eternal, the eternal kingdom. Again, ruled by a descendant of David, who is the God-man, the Messiah. So that's an unending promise. And then you have the land, the land uh, of Israel, the promised land always belongs to Israel. That's an unending covenant. And then you have the new covenant. Uh, that covenant, the new covenant, as you know, is made to Israel. It's an unending covenant. Um, and then the, how the church plays into that covenant is we partake in the blessings of that covenant, uh, but not the physical blessings of that covenant. We are partakers of that. That's an, un, an unending covenant, right? And in that covenant, we are promised that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit will be forever, uh, that we'll be given a glorified body that we'll live in forever, and other promises as well. Um, and then you have the Noahic Covenant, and many people don't realize that the Noahic Covenant is still in effect. Um, humans are supposed to repopulate the earth or, and, and subdue it, just like Adam and Eve were told, right? Um, and so um, there are provisions in there uh, that we have to do. Um, it says man's diet changed because of that. He can eat animals. So when you have these people telling you that you have to be vegetarian to be spiritual, that's a lie. Um, all foods are, are able to be eaten. Um, this is not only from the Noahic covenant, but this is, applies from what the apostle Paul told Timothy. Um, so all foods are on the table. Um, uh, another thing uh, that the Noahic covenant forbids is the eating and drinking of blood because blood is always a symbol of life. That was reiterated in Acts 15 to the church, especially the Gentile believers. So again, showing that the Noahic covenant is still in effect. Um, Noahic covenant stipulates capital punishment for murder. Um, and so that's still in effect. And, and one of the reasons for the tribulation period and why there's so much blood, um, you know, when you have, you know, the rivers and, and the oceans turning to blood, and then you have the, the blood bath that happens, uh, the lake of blood that, that happens at return of the Messiah, when he slaughters the Antichrist army, and then why there's so much blood? It's because mankind has not 
issued capital punishment for murder. And so God is paying back man for just the injustice of not doing capital punishment for murder. So that's why there's so much blood in the tribulation period. Um, he also promised in the way of covenant, humanity would not be destroyed by a worldwide flood, but the promise in scripture is man would be destroyed by the fire of judgment, which is in the tribulation. Um, and that's the, 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 the judgment that awaits the world right now. The token obviously is the rainbow given to in the Noahic covenant. So that, that covenant is still in effect. It's, um, and it is what God will use in the judgment of the Gentiles. Okay. Um, and this is, you can read this in Isaiah 24, five through six. The judgment comes due to the violation of the everlasting covenant of the Noahic covenant. That's the, the, the everlasting covenant given in Isaiah 24, 5 through 6 is the name given to the covenant in Genesis 9, 16. Okay? And you'll see uh, uh, a lot of times, um, uh, well, when you're reading, I think it's Revelation 14, when we get there, you'll see an angel flying around. Uh, proclaiming uh, the violation of the everlasting covenant or everlasting gospel or something like that. Uh, I think it reads everlasting gospel. Um, there is a reference for, for that. There's no doubt the gospel's there, but it's a reference to the Noahic covenant as well. Telling the nations, yes, you need to be saved, but also you're in violation of the Noahic covenant. And, and that's one of the other reasons for the tribulation. And that's why there's so much blood. So anyway, that's just an interesting side note, by the way. But it'll make sense when we get to those passages uh, because of the Noahic covenant. Anyway, with that being said, um, we're seeing again God's throne. And the verdict is, is that because God's, uh, God is holy and righteous and pure, that sin must be punished. But he has made a way and made promises to those who will accept his way through his son. And that is symbolic of the rainbow, okay? And so God is a promise-keeping God to those who turn to him in faith, and, and, and he will deliver them. That's the idea, just like he delivered Noah. And so here's what you have to do as far as uh, is application is concerned. So you've got to understand the symbolic nature of that and what the messaging is in the, sim in the symbol. But then you have to understand, okay, it's teaching you something about God. And what is it teaching you? It's teaching you the correct understanding about God. God is not a monster that wants to pound people into the ground. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He doesn't take delight in the death of the wicked, okay? Even though he will punish it, he doesn't take delight in it. He doesn't want to do this. Hell was actually created for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for mankind, but he had no other choice than to put unregenerate man in there because of them falling and breaking his law, okay? So this is the biblical God, the God that gives a way of escape but if you don't take that way, he punishes you, okay? It's a very, very balanced view of God when you see the throne and a rainbow. Now, the application is you and I have to be careful not to create our own predispositions about God, okay? You can't just make up things about God that you like or dislike and ignore them because this is a balance of promise and judgment, okay? That's what you're seeing. It's a perfectly balanced view of understanding God. When you look at the cross, it is a perfectly balanced view of God's grace and mercy, but God's judgment happening at the same time as you see Christ on the cross. Wrath is being poured out to him and, and on a totally righteous, eternally righteous individual that never has sinned, that's paying our debt, um, but yet the punishment that needs to happen, the justice, is being applied to him. So it's a perfect balance of 
God's grace and mercy and his judgment, just like this throne view is, okay? So here's what happens. People start making up things that they like about God or they don't like, so they add and subtract to God's nature. And what ends up happening, it gives them a perverted or distorted view of God. And that's what, you, that's what this message is teaching us. Um, you, you can't just say God is all loving without saying God is justice. And then you can't just view God as wanting to condemn everybody um, and not providing grace and mercy. So when it says that Jesus came in grace and truth, that's the balance. Grace is the relationship. Truth is, you know, the law, right? Grace and truth. So here's how, how to approach God. God approaches us relationally first. He wants a relationship with us, right? And then once that relationship is established, then he gives us truth or law. And so once a relationship is established, you will accept someone that loves you and cares for you and wants the best for you, him telling you, okay, this is how to live. You gotta do this and you gotta do that and this is the way I structured the universe, this is the way I designed the universe and this is how you function in that universe. And that's what his laws are, that's what his truth is, right? So grace and truth. If you reverse the aspect, then you have law first without relationship. And when you have law first without relationship, you have rebellion. And if, you, if you're a parent or a grandparent raising kids, it's the same thing. You have to have a relationship with your kids in order to give them law. If you don't have a relationship with your kids or your grandkids and you try to give them law, you will get nothing but rebellion. Now, it's endemic to teenagers and, and young adolescents to rebel, I get that. But I'm talking, uh, that's, that's normal. I'm talking about beyond normal. I'm talking about like, this kid's out of control. This kid's whacked out. This kid's lost his mind. The reason that happens many times is because a parent is laying down ridiculous rules and control over a child without any relationship whatsoever. And so naturally, uh, you try to do that and you're gonna get rebellion on your hands, big time, big time. Again, I'm not talking about regular rebellion that teenagers do, uh, those are normal. I'm talking about like in your face, I'm rebelling, you're not gonna tell me what to do, I'm out of here, you know, the, and going crazy and out of control type of thing. That's what happens to a lot of parents um, because they're parenting without relationship. Anyway, one of the things you have to be careful about is putting your pain and your trauma uh, into your vision of God. You know, and if you, you, we have all went through pain and trauma in our lives, no doubt about that. The problem is if you look at that uh, and put that on God, you're not gonna see God correctly. You're gonna see God uh, as not being there for you, that he wasn't present there, that he didn't provide for you, that he didn't help you, and a lot of people get that way. I mean, I've had, I've had people that counsel with me and they're so mad at God, they're, they're cussing at God and cussing the air blue and, and they're ticked off at God and, and when it really comes down to it, they are, have a distorted view of God because they're putting their pain and trauma and expecting that God should have rescued them when that's not, that's not the reality that, that we're in. That's not what God does, okay? Um, he allows freedom, and that is a big understanding. You have to allow freedom, and freedom means that people can sin against you. People can do bad things against you. It's not God doing it to you. And then in this reality that we're in, we have creatures that are spirit beings, like Satan, fallen angels, and demons, and they too can do things to you, right? So you can have sin from other people, you can have sin uh, being done against you from spirit creatures, fallen angels, demons. Um, you can have the fall affecting you, right? You can get sick or a hurricane hits you or tornado or whatever, and that affects you. Or then you and I can make bad decisions and sin and cause our own problems. So here's the thing. If you don't understand and identify where your pain and trauma is coming from, it's only gonna be from one of those four 
areas. Other people, the fall, Satan and his legions, or yourself, do not put that on God. God is the one trying to help you through things. So what Satan tries to do is make you blame God for your problems and your trauma and your pain so you can have a messed up relationship with him and you think he's some ogre that he didn't want to help you, he doesn't care about you, he's dis disassociated with you, doesn't care about your life or whatever, um, and then you're twisted off with God. And if you're twisted off with God, you're gonna be twisted off with others, guaranteed. That's how it works, okay? And so just like Cain, he got twisted off at God, and he got mad at Abel and killed him, okay? That's how it works. So it's very important what this passage is teaching you is to understand that God is fair. He gives freedom to individuals to make a choice, to take his way of salvation through the rainbow and, all, and receive all the promises and everything he says that he will give them, okay? But if you don't take that, he will judge you. That's a balanced view of God. That's how you have to understand God. And the fact that God has given you the freedom to make your choice. He doesn't force you to make your choice. You can follow him or you don't, you don't have to. You can believe in him or you don't have to, okay? But if you start distorting and getting unbalanced in your theology about God, it's gonna drive you away from him. That's why atheists become atheists, okay? They have a distortion of God. They think that God um, is causing the suffering in the world. They think that. They will not consider that free will is the cause of suffering in the world. They want, instead of blaming free will and the will of man, they want to blame God because it's an easier out. So that's what we have to make sure we're not doing, okay? We have to be balanced in our approach to theology. So with that being said, we're gonna stop there. And like I promised, next time I'm gonna to get to the 24 elders. I said that last time, but I'm gonna to get to that. But I wanted to emphasize the rainbow and all that it meant, okay? So anyway, keep studying your Bible, keep studying the book of Revelation, and keep digging deeper uh, to be conformed to the image of Christ. We'll see you next time. <music>